Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi, and today we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Jason Salsamendi, Assistant Professor of Radiology at University of Miami. Dr. Salsamendi, would you please explain what is radiofrequency ablation? My pleasure to explain that. Radiofrequency ablation is a mature technique where we're able to administer heat to tumors through a percutaneous, minimally invasive route with image guidance to be able to effectively treat the tumor and spare the surrounding tissues. Radiofrequency ablation can be performed in the liver, but in also other organs like kidney and lung, and has been shown to be very effective to treat tumors up to approximately three centimeters mm. in size and slightly larger depending on the uh, scenario. I see. You mentioned that it can be used in the lung. Typically, how many lesions do you require to do the to do the procedure? Ideally. We like to treat solitary lesions, okay. however, we can treat two or three lesions if necessary, uh, but we have to really assess those particular patients and we're dealing with multiple lesions and make sure that they don't have, those lesions are in good locations and amenable to this treatment. I see. And how should the patient mm -hmm. prepare the night before and morning of? All right, so the night before, they starting at midnight, they need to be MPS, that refrain from eating so that the next day they can be canvas for the procedure and be able to go and undergo general anesthesia, which I prefer um, to give to my to minister to our patients for this treatment. And the morning of, uh, they come to our hospital, they check in, mm -hmm. and go through the normal admission process to the hospital for this treatment. And uh, our nurse practitioner will then speak to them, make sure that they stop medications that uh, may lead to complications during this procedure, like Plavix, Aspirin, Coumadin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, once we get the appropriate history and physical, then we proceed, proceed with the procedure the same day. I see. And what if the patient has any specific allergies to shellfish or any other medicines? Um, um, during the procedure, we occasionally have to administer contrast. So if they have a history of contrast reactions, then we uh, like to uh, pick that up already in our clinic consult where we see our patients and if they ever do have a history of reaction then we have them pre-medicated. Uh, during the procedure they are also receiving general anesthesia so they have been seen by anesthesiologists so if they have any reactions to medications that they may need to administer then that's already addressed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after the procedure they are on antibiotics and, and also on uh, usually oral pain medication like Percocet. So we just want to make sure that they can tolerate those too. I see. And what should the patient experience during the procedure and even afterwards? All right, during the procedure in our institution, they're going to be under general anesthesia, so they're not going to be awake at all during the procedure. Uh, afterwards, they would expect to awaken in, uh, either in, within the procedural room or in the post-recovery area. Mm -hmm. And it uh, depends on the location of the lesion, but they may have varying pain from no pain at all, which I have seen in a good number of patients, to mm -hmm. a good amount of pain depending on how sensitive the area was that was treated. I see. And what should prompt a patient to either call you or go to the emergency room after the procedure has been done several days after? So our patients usually stay overnight, although some patients that uh, are really good candidates for the procedure can leave the same day, although it's relatively rare and more conservative than mm -hmm. my colleagues as well. Uh, and afterwards, they may feel some vague symptoms of nausea and, and uh, fatigue, almost flu-like symptoms, maybe low-grade temperatures. Mm -hmm. uh, but on antibiotics, it's really unlikely that infections are developed after the procedure. But if that were the case, they may get spiking fever, and that would have to prompt them to come to the ER. One of the other reasons we keep our patients overnight is to make sure that they don't have a delayed bleed from the ablation zone, which mm -hmm. is unlikely with radiofrequency ablation is we're heating the tissue and co coagulating the blood mm -hmm, in that area, mm -hmm. but uh, that's a complication that we want to assess for. Okay? Nice. And if they feel like they are, are lightheaded, have, you know, uh, feel like they could pass out at home, that could be signs of a delayed bleed, and mm -hmm. they should come in and seek care, although very rare. Nice. And what are the limitations of this procedure? Who would not be a candidate? Uh, this procedure is limited because it uses radio frequency energy, which can interact with pacemakers, AICD devices. So we routinely ask Ooh. patients that they have those devices in, in place uh, you know, that we know about in advance so that uh, we don't have a complication related to that. Also, in terms of the lesion location, this is uh, heating the lesion and it heats the nearby tissues up to 100 degrees, 120 degrees Celsius 
So if it's close to critical structures like colon, gallbladder, mm -hmm. stomach, there are some ancillary techniques that we can do to reduce non-target injury. Mm -hmm. But sometimes even with those treatments, we're not able to fully reduce it to a acceptable level and those patients may not be candidates. Mm -hmm. And also, all patients may be candidates but they not get a complete response if tumors are close to large vessels because those large vessels create what we call a heat sink effect of effectively cooling the margin of the tumor with um, the blood that's passing through that vessel. And those patients also may not get a complete response, so we are mm -hmm. uh, careful with that. And patients with multiple lesions scattered throughout the organ of the treatment uh, are also not great candidates for this treatment. I see. Well, thank you okay. so much. Sure. Thank you for watching. We hope this has been educational for you.